to speak today. And, and I'll uh, be glad at the end to entertain any, any questions y'all have about it. So I'm, I'm assuming that most of you have never heard of the Sewanee team of 1899. So let me take you back um, and kind of walk you through why we wanted to do this film and what it means. And we can, and there are many debates about what is the greatest college foot, football team ever, but there's one matter that's beyond debate. That is which college team had the most extraordinary single season in college football history. So let me take you back briefly to the year 1899. The president was William McKinley. There were 45 states. The Spanish-American War Treaty was signed that year. Horses and buggies were much more prevalent than automobiles, which had just been invented. And most communication was either by slow mail or by telegraph. And electricity and lights were still a novelty. Distance travel was primarily by train. And in our COVID environment, it's unique to note that in 1898, there was a yellow fever epidemic in the United States, which, act, which cut a lot of football seasons short. Also in 1899, the Civil War had, had ended 34 years earlier. And as you can imagine, in the South, it was still a vivid and stinging memory. And uh, the South was still recovering from the defeat and the reconstruction uh, from that war. Suwannee had originally been founded in 1858, but before it could open its doors, the Civil War intervened. And by the end of the Civil War, every building on campus had been burned, the cornerstone had been destroyed, and the treasury depleted. So they had a gift from the Suwannee Mining Company of 5,000 acres, but the proviso was they had to open their doors within 10 years. So it looked like they weren't going to meet that and were going to have to forfeit it. But by um, a miracle, literally, the, they opened their doors just in time to claim the 5,000 acres. And by 1899, Swanee was still a very small remote school. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's on top of a mountain between Chattanooga and Nashville. In 1899, it was all male. There were 20, 326 students with 122 undergrads, 26 theology students, 17 law students, and 161 medical students. And was, when Swanee was originally founded, the, the vision was it was going to be a huge university with not just undergraduate, but law schools, medical schools, theology schools, but all of that um, was destroyed in the Civil War. So by 1899, Swanee's struggling to survive. It doesn't have many finances. It's very remote. And the town of Swanee probably had about 1,300 people. So let me uh, just start the film by uh, this brief interview we had of Coach Vince Dooley. In 99, Swanee team will be unrivaled. No team ever in the history of college football will they ever be able to do what they did. And someone mentioned the tower. Uh, Breslin Tower um, was um, modeled after Magdalen College's tower in Oxford. Magdalen's Tower was built in 1492, and uh, Breslin Tower was built in the 1880s. So Swanee was a very remote school, not very wealthy, and uh, they were, as I said, struggling. So in the early 1890s, there was a new popular sport, very violent, that was emerging in the South. Um, called uh, football, and football began in 1869 when Rutgers and Princeton played a game, but we would not have recognized that as football. In fact, one commentator has 
called it basically a, a brawl called kill the ball carrier. And um, there were very little rules. It was sort of a mix of rugby and soccer. And it was a very brutal sport. And in the 1890s, football started to catch on in the South. And part of the reason for that is that by that time, young men had known their fathers and grandfathers who had fought in the great civil war. And they didn't have an opportunity to prove their manhood like they thought their ancestors had. And so football became kind of a proxy for battlefield glory. It was um, a very brutal sport. Uh, you weren't allowed to substitute. And um, it, it was really just a, a very different kind of sport, which we'll get into. It is the oldest field in the South. And we've been playing football on it since 1891. It's one of the great places to watch a college football game. The fog rolls in. And if you're sitting in the stands, you can't see anything on the field. Uh, the, the, you know, we'll punt the ball. <laughs> you have no idea. You know, you can hear if it was blocked, but you just can't see where it's going to land or who has it. So if any of you who've been to Suwannee, the football field that's still there today, They've been playing football on it since 1891. And uh, that's when Suwannee's first football game was. They played Vanderbilt and lost 22 to nothing. The next week, they played Tennessee and Chattanooga and won that game. And that was Suwannee's first victory. And that was Tennessee's first ever football game. It is. So football. Uh, developed in the South in the 1890s. It was a highly uh, unregulated game. There were some rules, but nothing like what we have today. You had three downs to make five yards. There was no forward passing. And if a player left the game for any reason, he could not return to the game. And so it was considered cowardly to actually leave a game unless you had something broken. So players stayed in when they were hurt. It was considered unmanly to come out of the game. They had very little protective equipment. And uh, it was a very, very brutal game. There were 35 minute halves and coaches, if they even had a coach, um, could not coach during the game. They had to be in the side on the sidelines or in the stands. And the scoring was a little bit different back then too. A touchdown was worth five points. And in order to score a touchdown, not only did you have to cross the goal line, but you actually had to get the ball and put it down on the ground, which is where the term touchdown came from. You could have an extra point either by a player lying on the ground and holding a ball while somebody kicked it through the goalpost, which was worth one point, or you could drop kick the ball. And you also had field goals, which were worth five points as well. So field goals and kicking were considered just as important, if not more important than scoring touchdowns. The rules were, as I said, very lax. Um, it was a, a, what, what we would now call a hurry up, no huddle offense. There were no huddles. And so players lined up, they ran a play. And as soon as that play was over, they lined up, ran it again. And because you played both ways, if you either fumble the ball or turn it over on downs, you, you suddenly go from playing offense to defense or playing defense to offense with no break. So it, it was quite a fast-moving, fast-paced game. And these are just some photos of uh, games around that area. You can see there's very little protective equipment. Helmets didn't even come into use until the 1890s. And they were very flimsy uh, leather helmets. This is an example. There, were no rip, there was no real line of scrimmage. 
they just lined up and went nose to nose. You also see on the right hand side, the formation. So the quarterback would have been a quarter of the way back. The halfback would be halfway back and the fullback would be all the way back. <clears throat> and um, it was really, um, really a tough sport because you had no break. You had to be ready to go on every play. And uh, it was not really a game for large people because there was so much running. Kicking was um, considered the way to advance the ball because field position was really important. So since you had no forward pass, kicking was the way to get the ball way down the field and hope you either held them on downs or they fumbled the ball and you could get it, uh, the ball advanced down to their end of the territory. Players themselves called every play. Coaches were not on the sidelines during the game. They had to be in the stands. The coaches didn't stand on the sideline and signal in the plays or have a player come over and tell him to play and he runs out onto the field. It gives you an idea of how well prepared these teams had to be to be able to execute anything. The captain of the team would use numbered codes for plays. The minute the ball is down, you take formation, the codes announce the next play. So it's boom, 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 boom at a very fast pace. You didn't have huddles. Everything was sort of a continuous sort of exhaustion game. It was a hurry up, no huddle back in 1899. So they're back at the line of scrimmage. And, of course, they're gouging each other for this five-yard mark in three plays. So it was like a short yardage goal line situation almost every snap. The, uh, as I mentioned, what, what they had as equipment was very rudimentary. For shoes, they would get old uh, leather boots and literally nail strips of leather onto the bottom for cleats. As I said, uh, Helmets were just coming into vogue, but they were very flimsy. They're not very protective. And most players at this time still played with long hair uh, as their padding. Uh, and helmets really didn't come into strong use until the 1900s. Um, jerseys were basically kind of um, wool shirts, pants didn't have much padding in them. And um, they really were exposed in, in this brutal sport to severe injury. And I love this photograph because it was considered uh, unmanly to leave the game, they'd stay in when they were hurt. And if you, if you see the guy on the left, that's actually a nose guard, it's made out of a strong rubber and they would put that around their forehead and the nose guard would cover their nose and there'd be a little mouthpiece they could bite into. So not a lot of uh, protective equipment. The uh, one of the rules was that you could pick up players and throw them over the line of scrimmage. So if you're on defense and you wanted to break up, a, say, a flying wedge, they'd grab one of the defenders and throw him over the line of scrimmage to try to tackle the ball carrier in the backfield. Likewise, if you wanted to gain extra yards, you could uh, grab an offensive player with the ball and throw him over to try to get extra yards. This gentleman, John Mara, is one of my former law partners at Bradley Aran. He has this wonderful story to tell. I'm the son of Hugh Mara. His senior year at the university, although he was a baseball player, they came to him and said he had to play football because they only had 10 people out for football. He weighed 117 pounds, so he played quarterback. He had straps on his uniform and on short yardage, the tackles would throw him over the line of scrimmage 
and he would frequently show people the scar he got during that maneuver. And they outlawed throwing people in 1913. Just one example, the captain of the team that year was a man named Henry Diddy Siebels. There are a number of Siebels who live in Birmingham today. And uh, we interviewed several of his grandchildren. But Siebels uh, in one game got his head split open in the first court, first half. And instead of coming out of the game, he just ran over. They put some plaster of Paris on it, and he stayed in that entire game and played the entire next game. So it was a different time and a different place uh, than what we know today. There were also, uh, at this time, many deaths. Around the turn of the century, there were 18 or 19 or 20 deaths a year from football, partly from the maneuver John Marr just talked about throwing people over, they would land on their head and break their neck. There were many, um, many severe injuries, many deaths, to the point that uh, in, two, in 1905, Teddy Roosevelt called a meeting of colleges at the White House and said, you've got a good sport, but you've got to clean it up or we're going to have to ban it. And that led to the formation of an or organization in 1906, that later became the NCAA. So let's go to Swanee in 1899. They had a team of 21 players that had a young coach from Princeton named Billy Souter. And the um, captain of the team, as I said, was Henry Siebel. He's the general the gentleman in the front row holding the football. He was a halfback uh, on, and a very elusive runner and the captain of the team. The, uh, at this time, colleges did not run the sports program. They were run by students. So football in 1899 was run, run entirely by students. And if you see the uh, man at the top with the hat on, his name is Luke Lee, L-E-A. He was a 20-year-old student. He had graduated from Suwannee the year before, but came back to get a master's primarily so he could run the football team. And he would be what we would call an athletic director today. But as a 20-year-old student, he handled all of the scheduling for the team, all the finances, handled getting equipment uh, to the extent he could. Most of these players, had to pay for their own uh, jerseys and pants, and they would have dorm matrons make it for them. So it was uh, a very different era because there wasn't really much oversight of the teams. There were no rules about practice regula regulations or number of people on the team. And uh, it was um, a different era. So that's Henry Siebels, who was the halfback and captain of the team. That's Luke Lee. Lee is a fascinating character. I wish we had more time to talk about him. After he left Sewanee, he founded the Nashville, Tennessean newspaper and was the owner and editor of that for many years. He became one of the youngest U.S. senators ever when the Tennessee legislature in 1911 elected him as a U.S. senator. And my favorite story, he fought in World War I, and uh, at the end of the war, he was visionary enough to realize that somebody needed to pay reparations or the German people were going to suffer and uh, ultimately lead to another problem, which in fact happened. So he got a group of soldiers without permission and went to Belgium to try to kidnap Kaiser Wilhelm II and bring him to the Paris uh, peace treaty talks to force him to get reparations. They actually got inside the castle before they were thwarted, but that's the kind of person he was. That's Billy Souter, the coach. He's, as you can tell, a very young man himself. He had played at Princeton and came down to Suwannee in 1899 to coach their football. He later, uh, 
went to work for Luke Lee on the Nashville, Tennessee, and, and Souter hired Grantland Rice and gave him his first uh, newspaper job. I also want to talk a little bit about this man, Cal Burris. Uh, Cal Burris was a, a gentleman who lived in Sewanee. We know nothing about him except that he was called a rub down man. And his job was to handle all the equipment, get, get the train loaded, uh, do whatever they needed to do. But also during um, the trips on the train, the sport was so brutal that these players would wake up in the middle of the night in severe pain, screaming, and Cal would have to get up and uh, literally rub them down till they could go back to sleep. In our film, we're calling him the un un unsung hero. There may have been, in fact, a second African-American, and we don't even know his name. We know nothing about them. This is the only photograph that we've ever found of Cal Burris, but they were the un unsung heroes that allowed the team to have the kind of year it did. And we're certainly highlighting them in our film. One of the people that was part of that whole team, though, was the trainer. The 1899 team had a rub down man. This was an African-American by the name of Cal Burris. And as the players had aches and pains, literally, Cal would rub them down. The pain from the, the beatings that the players took was so acute that they would wake up in the middle of the night. And then they would call these men in again. One of the people that was part of that Sorry. team, though, was Cal would rub them down. The pain from the, the beatings that the players took was so acute that they would wake up in the middle of the night. And then they would call these men in again and wake them up. And they would come in and rub their muscles, rub their joints, and help them fall asleep again. We know a lot about virtually every play that the Sewanee team executed throughout the season. But we don't know much about these rubbers, except that they were there and that the players regarded their ministrations, regarded their services as vital. So Luke Lee, as the manager of the team, was charged with getting the schedule. And in the 1890s and early 1900s, the biggest game of the year in the South was Sewanee and Vanderbilt on Thanksgiving Day. It was such a big game that um, Sewanee basically made enough out of the gate receipts from that one game to pay for their entire season. But in 1899, for, for some reason, Luke Lee was unable to agree on the split of the gate receipts with Vanderbilt, and that required him to uh, try to figure something else out to pay for the season. And what he came up with is, will forever cement Sewanee in the history of college football. He crafted a schedule that required the game to play 12 games in six weeks. And even more astonishingly, he arranged for a trip on the road via train that would travel 2,500 miles and the Suwannee team would play five games in six days all on the road. That started out because Suwannee had played Texas in 1898 and had beaten them. And Texas wanted a rematch, and they offered Swanee $750 if they would come to Austin. Well, that was enough to pay for a good part of the trip, but in order not to eat it all up, Luke Lee then put in together the schedule so they would leave Swanee and go to Austin. They played Austin. They played Texas and Austin on Thursday. They played Texas A&M in Houston on Friday. They played Tulane in New Orleans on Saturday. They took Sunday off. Then they played LSU and Baton Rouge on Monday and uh, Ole Miss in Memphis on Tuesday. And the way they traveled, of course, was by train. This is called the Mountain Goat. It was the train 
that went between Sewanee and Cowan. And at that time, this uh, train track was the steepest slope in the world for a train. And that's why they called this a mountain goat. And they would take that down to the bottom of the mountain to Cowan and get on a Pullman sleeper for their trips. Love to have been in that room when he brought up the idea. Hey, here's a great idea that's going to help generate some revenue. We're going to travel around throughout the South and in six days and play five games. I mean, it's it's unheard of. He's not thinking about the history books. He's thinking about maintaining the program at Swan. But he certainly saw uh, the uh, great potential of this team and of this story and of this uh, itinerary uh, that he put together for the 1899 team. Love to have been in that room with you. So I'll tell you a little bit about a few of the characters. Um, this is William Claiborne. He was called Wild Bill Claiborne. He's on the left with the eye patch. And Claiborne had a, a bad eye. And he was known for starting a game. He would line up across the line from his opponent. He'd lift the patch, point to his bad eye, and say, this happened in the last game. We'll see what happens today and put the patch back down, try to get his opponent worrying about that. Uh, as I said, that on that road trip, they played Ole Miss. This is a picture of the 1899 Ole Miss team. And you'll notice that none of them have helmets. They were known at, as the long-haired Knights of the Oval from Oxford. And they... Um, only had long hair for padding. And in fact, when Sewanee showed up in Memphis to play them, the Ole Miss players objected that some of the Sewanee players had these little flimsy leather helmets and thought that they should not be allowed to play with them, but the referee let the game go forward. <clears throat> the uh, After they went on this road trip, they, they were successful. They um, had already played three games before the road trip. In the road trip, they scored 91 points to their opponents zero and came back um, to Sewanee victorious after winning all five games in six days. And they were greeted as heroes when they got back to Sewanee. And it was already starting to be seen as epic trip that um, had never been done before. And as we know now, will never be done. There's a poster that um, is famous among Suwannee people that says they played five games in six days and on the seventh day they rested. But in fact, that's not true. They didn't rest. They still had three more games to play, including the two toughest teams in the South that year one of whom was Auburn. And if you'll see on the near the top left, a, a man with his hair parted in the middle, that's John Heisman of the Heisman Trophy. He was the coach of the Auburn team in 1899. And uh, Suwannee ended up playing them on Thanksgiving day in 1899 in Montgomery. 4,000 people showed up for that game, which uh, was unheard of in the South. And that's, that shows that football was really starting to catch on and become popular. This is, uh, we have a marvelous illustrator. His name is Ernie Eldridge from Birmingham, who did a number of illustrations for us of the season. This is one he did of the Auburn Suwannee game. There were no grandstands in Montgomery, so the crowd was right up next to the field. Uh, in fact, Sewanee accused Heisman of putting in more than 11 players because it was hard to tell who was in and who was out. There were fist fights during the game. There were guns pulled. It was really, a, as Coach Dooley called it, a barroom brawl. It was a very rough crowd a lot of arguments, and uh, a lot of delays in the game. One of the delays came because when Swanee showed up, they discovered that Auburn had sold 
sewn leather handles on their pants so that the players can grab each other's handles and either pull themselves forward or pull the ball carrier forward. And um, Luke Lee and Coach Suter asked the refs to cut them off because Swanee was getting killed. The, if you see the front line of the Auburn players, they would lock arms and form this wedge and then grab each other's handles. And it was so brutal that they were running all over the Suwannee people to the extent that Coach Suter told his players to go out on cleat first, knock their legs out so that they could make the tackle. Eventually, the refs did stop the game to uh, make Auburn cut off the handles. But it was, a, it was a tough game for Suwannee. Auburn really probably was the better team that day, and they were running all over them. This is my friend Henry Siebels, whose grandfather was the captain of the team, and he has this family lore about the Auburn game. My Uncle Emmett came down to my grandfather at halftime and said, Diddy, you've got to do something. We bet the house on the game. We're down 10 to nothing. We've got to do something. We'll lose the house. We have to kick your mother out. So the uh, – as I said, the Auburn team had the upper hand. They were running all over Suwannee. Suwannee was ahead 11 to 10, and 14 minutes into the second half, instead of a 35-minute half, 14 minutes in, the ref called the game for darkness, and Suwannee won 11 to 10. Heisman and his team and the crowd were outraged, and Suwannee uh, hightailed it out of there. Interestingly, because you'd never see this today, a week, week or two after this game, John Heisman wrote the Birmingham Age Herald newspaper and uh, wrote a long letter to the editor, which basically accused the refs of cheating and said, we should have won, we were the better team, and the refs cheated us out of this. The next day, the referee, a man named Taylor, wrote a reply to Heisman's letter, basically saying he's just a big crybaby and everybody knows it. And Heisman then responded to that. So it was quite amusing that the referee and the coach are battling each other in the Birmingham Age Herald newspaper. So Swanee at this point is 11 and 0. They're beat up. They've been through a lot. And, and they had the final game of the year against North Carolina that's going to be played in Atlanta. And North Carolina had beat Georgia on Thanksgiving Day. So this was seen as the championship of the South for whoever won this particular game. Um, so there was a goal line stand during the North Carolina game. I, I, I thought I had a diagram of it. I apologize, I don't. But North Carolina got the ball with first down on Suwannee's uh, three-yard line, and they ended up, instead of three downs, they had five downs to make a touchdown because Suwannee was called offsides twice. But somehow Suwannee held on, one of the great goal line stands of the time. And uh, as the Suwannee student newspaper said later, Suwannee stopped them on the fifth down within three inches of defeat. And that, that ended up with Sewanee being 12 and 0 for the year. They played 12 games in a six week time period. The uh, Sewanee team for the year scored 322 points and the opponents 10, that was Auburn's 10 points were the only points scored against uh, Sewanee that year. Another person we want to highlight is Orman Simpkins. He was the fullback on the team and also known as a vicious tackler and blocker. Simpkins' um, legs were so damaged by his years of football that um, in the early 1900s, he had one of his legs amputated due to the damage from football. He wrote a letter, which we have, and uh, it's very poignant. He wrote a letter to 
Wild Bill Claiborne in 1916, saying being crippled for life is no small matter. And he was bitter at Luke Lee and bitter at uh, Coach Suter for making him play when he was hurt and didn't want to. In the uh, early 1920s, when he was 42 years old, he went into Georgetown Medical Hospital to uh, have his second leg amputated and he died on the operating table. So yeah, this is a great story about glory and winning, but it's also a, a story of, of pain and sacrifice. Uh, this is a little fun I had with one of the team photos of um, the Swanee team, We Want Bama. And uh, this is the trailer for our film, so I thought I'd show that to you for a minute. South football team has to be the most amazing story in college football history. The 99 Swanee team will be unrivaled. No team ever in the history of college football will ever be able to do what they did. I'd like for every player to be able to read that story. Swanee. It's unbelievable. And they've got a record of my left top. It had to be one of the greatest adventures as they went from school to school to school and came back to Solani, bearing the moral victory. The Swanee team won five games in six days, and on the seventh, they rested. Actually, they didn't because they had to go win three more games. It's unthinkable to imagine what they went through, what their bodies went through, and how they managed to survive it and to be as good as they were. These guys never came out of the game. You had to play both ways. If you came out, you did not get the opportunity to come back in. There are so many extraordinary layers on this story. You peel one back and you say, no. At one time, we played against and prevailed over these schools that are now nationally known football powerhouses. It's more than lore. It's true. Really, in athletics, it is the ultimate David versus Goliath story. Anytime anything is ever written, about the history of college football. So why would be mentioned? The team of 1899 speaks to the best of who we used to be and also gives us a guidepost of who we choose to be going forward. One of the founding myths of the University of the South is that we had this remarkable team that did remarkable things as sports have become ever more important both in the American South and in the life of the country. There's something about saying we were once great too. They are probably one of the most remarkable teams in the history of college football. They hope to win a championship. They end up going down in history. And they did it for the love of the game. And everyone who cares about college football should know their story. So that's uh, an overview of the film and the team. Um, I hope this piqued some interest. I'm more than happy to answer any questions any of you might have. I should also note, we're doing a premiere of our film at the Alice Stevens Center at UAB's campus on April 21st at 7 p.m. Tickets are $25 and all proceeds are gonna be benefit the Monday Morning Quarterbacks Foundation, which means that Children's Hospital and the uh, UAB Medical Arts uh, Program will be direct beneficiaries of all the proceeds from that premiere. So would love to have any of you who wanna come, uh, come to that as well. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Does Swanee still have a football team? Swanee still has a football team. They uh, um, 
still play in um, a division three, which means there are no athletic scholarships. So they ha they're in a conference with schools like um, uh, Rhodes and Memphis, Millsaps and Jackson, some other schools. They they play um, W and L is in a different conference, but they play them a lot. So they they still play today. What do you think uh, caused football to become well? It's still violent, but but more protective of the players. Well, that there were so many of them getting literally uh, paralyzed or killed. And uh, that's when Teddy Roosevelt called that meeting. He, there, there was a hue and cry to banish the sport. And in fact, in 1897, a player for the University of Georgia named Richard Von Gammon died. And as a result of that, the Georgia legislature passed a law banning football in the state of Georgia. And the only reason the law didn't get signed was Van Gommen's mother wrote the governor of Georgia and said, my son loved football and he would not want to be the reason it got banned. Please don't sign the bill. And because of her letter, he didn't sign the bill. So it was really a violent sport, lots of injuries, lots of um, deaths. And uh, they realized they had to start cleaning up the game. One of the things that John Heisman advocated for, which came into existence in 1906, was the forward pass, which Heisman thought would make the game both more exciting and safer. And it, it did. And then as they made advances in equipment, protective equipment, that also, and, and some rule changes, that also helped make the sport safer. Do you know when the... Uh field goal went from five points to three? And why? I don't know that. Um, that's a good question. I need to look that up. But I don't know that. But it, it's interesting that at that time, kicking was in many ways seen as the superior skill. Any more questions? Well, this isn't a question. This is Rosemary, but my father played on the Vanderbilt team in the 1920s, and the pictures I've seen of him show them wearing pretty much the same kind of uniforms and equipment and leather helmets uh, that you showed in this presentation. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, if you look at pictures through the 1950s, mostly um, it's still leather helmets. So it... it that part didn't change a lot until the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. So Norman, did you play football? I did not, um, but I love football. Uh, any more questions? Any last question? Guess not. Well, Norman, thank you for this. I, it, um, I guess the old days of football is, is something I really hadn't thought much about. And was this was very interesting as to how it evolved and, and perhaps why. I always thought of hockey as the more violent sport, but <laughs> it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> okay. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you for you. your time. I appreciate it.